Okay, let's get started now. Okay, so this next session is going to be run from our lovely Kelly. Uh, she works for Monash University. She's going to be speaking about a couple of different things today. Um, now, I'm based in uh, Brisbane, Queensland, and Kelly is based in Melbourne, but we're both in Australia. I'll take it over to you, Kelly. Thanks, Angela. So uh, as Angela said, my name is Kelly and today I'm talking about a study that I've been part of through my research group at Monash University. Now, the goal of this research has been to really understand and try to measure some of the stresses that we, uh, that we know are experienced by young people who are affected by HD. And our ultimate aim of the study uh, is to create a survey that can be used in the clinic and by researchers to understand uh, what's happening for young people in HD families. So before I get too far into it, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself and what I do. So as Angela said, I am talking to you today from Melbourne, Australia, where I work as a neuropsychologist and as a researcher with people who are affected by HD. So as a neuropsychologist, my job is to work with people who have uh, thinking and memory changes, as well as changes in behaviour that can lead to uh, difficulties uh, with our day-to-day -day life. So that might be things like working, might be things like studying, driving a car or living independently. My research has really been about the psychiatric or mood-based changes that are often experienced in HD and specifically how best we should measure them, including stress. So we know that there are many life changes that can be a source of stress for young people who are affected by HD. And when I say affected, I really mean anyone close to a person with HD. So that could be a young person with a parent or a grandparent that has HD. It could be a young person with a HD gene, or it could be a person who's living at risk of HD. We know that no matter how HD touches a person's life, it can be associated with really unique stresses that many other young people don't, don't face or, or don't, um, you know, yeah, don't, have, don't need to, to think about. Now, despite, so some of these stresses might be things like emotional, uh, emotional stresses. So that might be things like feeling isolated or misunderstood. It could be functional, so things like caregiving, um, so people might need to be um, take on more caregiving sort of a role. It could be financial, so maybe needing to support family members that aren't able to work anymore. Uh, and they can also be social stresses. So that's things like relationships with others. And when we talk about relationships, it could be at work, it could be at school, it could be with our intimate partner. So despite all of these stresses, uh, that are really unique for people, uh, for young people affected by HD, we don't really have very good ways of measuring the type of stress or the amount of stress that young people affected by HD actually experience. And most of the tools we have currently are either not specifically designed for young people uh, and some of them aren't even designed for HD. Now, um, measurement doesn't always sound that exciting. Um, you know, I'm well aware that you know, it's um, not one of the people um, over the course of um, the Congress that are talking about cures or talking about treatments for HD. But if we are going to design effective treatments or, we, um, or programs to support young people affected by HD, we really do need to have a way to know what kind of stresses our programs should target. And we also need to know whether they're working. Um, and so measurement it sort of underpins all of those things. It helps us to know what kinds of stresses are important to young people, what kinds of experiences young people are having. It also helps us to know if our treatments are working over time. So for example, uh, whether the stress that someone experiences right now is the same as the stress they experienced a year ago, or the same as the stress that they might experience in a year's time. And, we, and measurement is really important both in a clinic setting and in research settings. So our clinicians will, always, will often use sort of um, measurement tools and, and so do all of our research trials. So measurement of symptoms and experiences really does underpin all of our treatments, all of our programs 
um, and any kind of um, cure that we might one day hope for. So with all that in mind, um, the aims of this study were to, one, really try to understand the life stresses that are important to young people who are affected by HD. And on the back of that, to design a survey for clinicians and researchers to be able to measure these life stresses. So we wanted to know conceptually what is stressful for people and what are the issues that young people are facing. But secondly, what can we practically do um, after knowing that to support them? And, and that's where um, this survey came in. So in this study, we looked at all of the stress surveys that were available to date. Um, and we took the questions that we thought were the most relevant for young people affected by HD. And we also wrote some new ones based on what we thought was important. Um, and that was based on past studies, as well as our research group's experience, both in research, but also in the clinic. And so through that process, we ended up with a total of 223 questions, uh, which we then went through and removed the questions um, that overlapped a lot with each other. So often these, the, um, the questionnaires that we were getting our questions from had very similar questions. So we removed anything that was duplicated or that was redundant. And in doing so, we got ourselves down to 100 questions. And so with those 100 questions, we put them onto an online survey platform. And we asked for feedback from researchers and clinicians who were working in the HD space about how each question was worded and how relevant they thought each question was. And then we did the same thing with other young people who were affected by HD. So we wanted both feedback from professionals working in HD, but also HD people, um, people affected by HD themselves. So we really wanted to make sure that we were getting everyone's point of view um, in this process. And then on the back of that, we, we also did some focus groups. Uh, with people about what they found challenging about growing up in a HD family and what they thought was important to measure. So I, I can't emphasize how important that was. So we did that because we wanted to make sure that we hadn't missed any stressful experiences and that the way our questions were written reflected the experiences of the people that we were trying to represent when we were doing this work. So before I go any further, I thought I would share some of the uh, some of the interesting themes that came up in the focus groups, uh, and some of the key areas that people really um, really talked about and really emphasised when we were talking about some of the the life experiences that had that had caused stress. So uh, this slide here is to to point out some of the issues around genetic testing that people often brought up and, and how the process of genetic testing and whether to undergo genetic testing had been a, a big stressor for them. So this this first um, quote here is for a person um, that was gene, uh, they didn't know their gene status, they decided not to undergo genetic testing. And they said they thought their biggest, their biggest con would be that if I knew that I was gene positive, then I would think about it more. Whereas at the moment, I don't know, so I don't worry, I don't worry about it myself. Uh, whereas in stark contrast, their, their sister um, said they were, that they thought that the uncertainty was definitely worse. Uh, and they said, I mean, the way I think is that I know if I can sort of make better plans and decisions, whether that be positive or negative. And it really highlighted that even amongst um, people within the same family, having really different, um, different opinions or different responses to that, that's, that, um, that situation and, and how they responded to it. We also saw some cultural um, perspectives come through with respect to the genetic testing. So we had one participant who talked a lot. Um, so they were from, they had sort of an Asian cultural background and they said, I think my grandmother is still denying the fact that HD is a genetic problem because in Asian cultures, we don't like to talk about genetic diseases because of this term bad blood that we don't wanna be associated with. People don't really know how these genetic diseases work. They just assume that if one person has it, everyone has it and it's just in the blood. And you know this. This really, you know, these. Um, this participant was um, 
I guess, came from a, a particular cultural um, background that was very different from a lot of the other participants in that same focus group. And so their experience was quite nuanced. Um, and I think it, it really highlighted just how different people's um, experience with this process is. The next thing that really came up in our focus groups was the process with some of the stresses around relationships and those relationships um, extended, you know, really far, far reaching. So this first quote is a person who's talking about uh, whether to tell people at work that they've tested positive. So pre-symptomatic, but has tested positive for the gene. And she said, I don't want to give people an opportunity to think, oh, well, we won't give her, her something stressful here or maybe we won't do this and sort of create the atmosphere around my work that isn't healthy and isn't reflective of how I am now. And so for her, she sort of talked about this being a bit of a carrying a bit of a weight in that she had this information, but was really cautious about who to share that information with. And that was something that she found to be quite difficult. This next quote was a person talking about uh, her relationship with her intimate partner. Uh, and this is also a person who had tested positive. Uh, and she said, in my mind, even if you're positive, you might still have kids because that's what ha had happened in our family. But my partner was completely, it was black and white for him. If you're positive and you can't guarantee that your kids wouldn't have it, no kids. And that was quite shocking for me because it made me think about what if mum and dad had thought that too. And, you know, this, this particular quote was, um, yeah, I think it was, it was really pleasing that someone felt comfortable to share that, but it was also like something that had been a really a difficult situation for her and um, for her to navigate with her partner. And then the final thing that I wanted to point out just in terms of our focus groups that came up a lot was future planning. So making decisions about what to do in the future. So, oh, I'll press the wrong button, we'll move forward. So this is um, a person who was talking uh, about, um, again, having tested positive, but being pre-symptomatic and they were talking about still having a big life ahead of them uh, and the sort of stress around what kinds of commitments to have. So having a family yourself or bigger questions of, do I give up and go traveling now? And so here we're thinking, you know, what kinds of decisions might you make and how, how does um, genetic status sometimes influence those decisions? And then this person here is talking about some of the financial stresses that they felt they had to face after testing positive. And this is specifically around um, their, their finances and perhaps not being able to work for as long as they thought they might have and whether they were financially set up. So these are just some of the different concerns that were raised in the focus groups, but they were really important because they helped us understand what kinds of questions we should be including in our survey and also how those, how those questions should be phrased for people. Um, so that we were really trying, we really wanted to make sure that what we were asking people in that survey was, um, was relevant to them. So then after our focus groups, we spent some time revising our initial question, questions for our questionnaire or our survey, and we removed questions that overlapped or that young people didn't think were relevant. And that left us with 66 questions in total for our next version of the survey. And that's our most current version. So we took our, our, that current survey to people affected by HD across the world. So we've asked people um, far and wide to fill out this survey. Um, and the questions typically describe an event or a situation. And then they ask people how much stress they have experienced from that event or situation. And so far we've had 96 people complete the survey. Uh, all of them have been somewhere between 18 and 35 years of age, but the, the majority have been around from somewhere between 26 to 35. 75% of our samples so far have been female. Uh, so we'd really like to hear um, from, from some more men, um, but we've had a pretty good mix of people who are gene positive, gene negative and gene unknown. Okay, so I thought I'd include just an example of what one of the, what the questionnaire looks like 
um, at the moment. So it's, it's an online questionnaire. So here it's asking um, the respondent about stress related to emotions and worries. So the idea is that you tell us how each statement causes you to feel stress on a scale of one to five. So the first item is worrying that I will develop HD, feeling as though no one knows what I'm going through, feeling judged because other people don't understand HD or not knowing how or if to tell others about HD. Okay. So what have we found so far? So, so far we found that there are these three main stresses that come up time and time again, and they are things related to personal experiences. So um, a person's ability to function independently, genetic testing is a big one, the social and personal relationships. So intimate partners and work and study relationships. And then also family related stresses. So people needing to take on more responsibilities at home. Um, people also maybe needing to take on more financial responsibilities or making decisions around family planning. Now, the reason that we're, so we're still collecting responses on the survey. And the idea here is that we get enough responses that helps us to do some statistical analyses with those responses that helps us narrow down the number of items that are on our survey. I haven't gone into too much of the statistics in this talk because uh, I wasn't sure how fun that would be on a Sunday afternoon um, here in Australia. But suffice to say, the idea is that we get lots of people to respond to this survey and then we're able to use some statistical models that help us understand which questions are the most important questions for us to include. So as I said, our ultimate goal is a survey tool that will help clinicians and researchers better understand what young people are experiencing and what helps us to support them. And, uh, and again, this comes back to the importance of measurement. So we know that measurement is, is really important for good clinical care. Clinicians need to be able to monitor change over time and make sure that whatever treatments or programs or supports they're putting in place are working and measurement underpins that. And likewise, our researchers are always using measurement tools um, to measure the, the efficacy or the success of whatever um, there is, it is they're studying. So if they're using an intervention, does that intervention work? And so this tool is, is really, we're trying to create something that's very specific to young people that are affected by HD because there just really isn't anything available to us at the moment in this space. As I said at the beginning, most of what we have at the moment is either not designed for people with Huntington's disease or people affected by Huntington's disease, or it's not really targeted at young people. And so young people have a very specific set of um, things that they're facing as a function of um, their life stage. And, and they're the things that we're trying to capture. So if you do still want to be involved in this study, you're more than welcome to, and we'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, so I put the link to the study, the um, questionnaire on the slide, as well as a QR code. You're more than welcome um, to be involved if you'd like to be. Um, yeah, as I said, we'd really love to hear from, um, from more people and what people um, are experiencing. Uh, Kelly, we actually have a question from Claire. So she wants to know, do you have to be in Australia to take part? No, absolutely not. You can be from anywhere in the world to take part in the study. Yeah, it's, um, we have ethics across, um, we have ethics for anyone living anywhere. So, um, and the survey itself will actually ask you to, to tell us where in the world you're living or where in the world you're from um, so that we can get a sense. And so we, we have had people from uh, America, we've had people from the UK, people from Europe, um, people from South America, people from Australia and people from New Zealand mostly that have responded. But certainly wherever you are, please feel free to take part. We've also just had a request from Tina. Uh, are yeah. you able to post the link in the chat or send that to one of us and we can post that for you? 100%, yeah, I'd love to. That makes it too easy, no worries. I think maybe I can post it in the chat. Um, I did also wanna just um, say um, that uh, 
I wanted to make sure that I left people with some resources. Obviously, I've talked about some things that actually might bring up some stuff for people. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that, you know, people had a, a space to go to, um, particularly people that are in our Australian region. Um, so this is a recently launched Huntington's Disease Network of Australia. And this has been launched by the, the lab group that I work in, our study group, so at Monash University. And this is a network that aims to ensure that anyone, no matter where they live, um, has access to the services they need. So people living in rural and regional areas, just as much as metropolitan centres. And the website itself, um, even for people living abroad, has heaps of resources and links and information, as well as research that people might want to take part of, uh, part in. So definitely I encourage you guys to check it out um, or send an email if you're interested. And as I said, there are some international resources, including the link to HDEO on that website. So yeah, there's heaps of stuff. It doesn't it's not necessarily um, only people living in Australia. Um, and my email's also there if anybody wants to get in touch with me specifically about anything I've talked about. And uh, I suppose with that, I wanted to say thank you and um, to enjoy the rest of Congress. Thank you very much for letting me um, to letting me speak here today and for um, for listening to, to what we've done um, as part of this research and more than happy to answer any questions or equally hear about your experiences or anything people want to share. Okay, we'll just maybe wait a little bit. There might be some questions coming through. Sure, no worries. See if I can get that link as well. Uh, we do actually have a question from Haley. So does Monash have any events planned so far for this year? Does Monash have any events planned for the year? Um, in uh, HD sort of specific events, I assume. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so we actually, that's a great question. Um, we have a, we're going to do a launch of the Huntington's disease, the HGNA, which is the Huntington's Disease Network of Australia. So that had like a, we called it a soft launch, which was mo mostly an online launch last year because of COVID. We didn't get to do anything for it. But the plan is actually to be able to have a bit of a, um, a day to launch that where people from the community are invited to take part. Um, so that that would probably be the, the one thing I would think of from a Monash point of view. But if people are living in Victoria, there's also some really cool events coming up with HD Vic, which is the state association in Victoria. And there's a gala ball that's coming up in May and there's heaps of events in May through them. So that would be another place I'd check out events if you're looking to join um, more things happening in the HD community in Victoria. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, and our lovely Leanne, um, if you're able just to go up to the slide with the link, she'll type that in the chat for everyone. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Leanne. And also thank you, Kelly. That was absolutely amazing. I even learned so much information that I didn't know being in Australia as well. So that was really beneficial for me. Wonderful. Thank you all. It was really, yeah, I'm really glad to have been a part of it. I will stop sharing. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kelly. I really appreciate that. Um, looks like Leanne's just popped that link in the chat there. So all of the other attendees will be able to access that link now.